Hello and welcome back to Anthropology 201 World Cultures. This is Lecture Series 3, Part 1. In this series, we are going to be looking at family structure, marriage, kinship systems, and horticulturalist societies. So, before we look at our horticulturalist societies, we are going to further our anthropological perspective by looking at family, marriage, and kinship systems first. Now, the reason we are going to be looking at family and kinship in addition to horticulturalist societies is that we will be looking at a number of cultures in this section that have very fascinating kinship, marriage, and family practices. So, for us to observe these customs from an anthropological perspective, we need a bit of background information first. So, let's get started, shall we? <clears throat> this is a Yanomamo kinship chart. It follows the Iroquois classification pattern. The major features of this system are the application of a bifurcate merging rule. Be, but basically, <clears throat> the father's brother and father are merged into a single term, but is different than the mother's brother. If you've noticed, Ego's blue triangle, indicating his father, is Haya. The father's brother is also called Haya. If you look at the Ego's red circle, indicating his mother, or their mother, uh, they're named Naya, as well as the mother's sisters, also named Maya. But the pink triangle on the mother's side, the mother's brother is not called Haya like we see with the father's brother, and likewise with the father's sister, not being referred to as Naya. So in a word, everyone in Yanomamo society is called by some kinship term that can be translated into what we would call blood relatives. So everyone, be it friend, enemy, outsider, anyone gets placed into some sort of kinship matrix, which to a large degree specifies in principle how one is expected to behave. So to be outside the Yanomamo kinship system is to be considered non-human. Real humans are some sort of kin. Now, how do we define kinship? Well, kinship refers to the relationships that are based on blood or marriage. So, by this definition of kinship, we have two types of relationships. Those people to whom we are related through birth or blood which are our consanguineal relatives, and those to whom we are related through marriage, which are our affinal relatives. Now, kinship terminology is an aspect found in every society. All societies have words that define a person's relationship to each other, and that word also dictates certain behaviors that are expected as a result of that particular title. Meaning, culturally, our grandma has a particular role to play as the grandma that is different than the role of the brother. Now, 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 I, I know what you're thinking. What about Uncle Bob? We all have that one friend of the family that we call our aunt or uncle or something of that sort. They are not related to us by blood or marriage, but we do consider them part of our family. Well, there is another type of kinship called fictive kinship. Now, fictive kinship is a relationship that is determined by neither blood nor marriage. So this would entail close family friends, adoption, and godparents and godchildren. Now, these examples 
remind us that it is possible to have kinship-like relatives or relationships without an actual biological or marital connection. Now, some societies define kinship in primarily biological terms, whereas in other societies, like the Bari, believe in partable paternity. Now, partable paternity is the notion that a child can have more than one biological father. And it is because of these differences that anthropologists must learn to draft kinship diagrams. Now, although all societies have kinship systems, the definitions of the relationships between kin vary from one society to the next. So, in different societies, people have the same biological connection, may be defined and labeled differently, and are expected to behave differently toward one another. And in order to better understand and disseminate what is learned by the anthropologist, we developed a set of symbols to create diagrams and map relationships. Now, as you can see on the screen, that the triangles represent males, circles represent female. Then we have the red square to represent non-specific genders. If the two are married or in some sort of relationship, we use an equal sign. Divorce from denotes the equal sign with a slash through it. Now a vertical line connects parents to children, whereas the bracket connects siblings to one another. If a family member is deceased, the symbol has a line put through it. Now, ego can be represented by a circle, a triangle, but it can also be represented by our non-specific gendered square. In addition to all of these symbols, we also have a alphabetic code that goes with it. The Mother is represented by an M, father F, son is S, daughter is D, brother is B, sister is Z, husband is H, and wife is W. Now, in a kinship diagram, there is an individual that acts as the point of reference. This person is referred to as ego. It is ego's perspective that the kinship diagram is drawn from. Now if you look on the screen I have included an example of a kinship diagram. Now a kinship system encompasses all of the blood and marriage relationships that help people distinguish among different categories of kin. It also creates rights and obligations among kin and serve as the basis for the formation of certain types of kin groups. Now that's very important, so I'm going to repeat that a little slower. A kinship system encompasses all of the blood and marriage relationships that help people distinguish among different categories of kin, create rights and obligations among kin, and serve as the basis for the formation of certain types of kin groups. Now, like I mentioned before, some societies differentiate among kinship categories based on blood or through marriage. For example, we distinguish between son and son-in-law, daughter and daughter-in-law, but we do not distinguish between our mother's brother, who is a blood relative, and our mother's sister's husband, who is a relative by marriage. Instead, both are referred to as uncle. 
anthropologists also use the narrower term descent to refer to a person's kinship connections traced back through a number of generations. Descent groups serve as a mechanism for inheriting property and political office, as well as regulating marriages and structuring primary political units. Now, there are two distinct types of descent. First, there is unilineal descent, and second, multilineal descent. Now, unilineal descent is descent traced either through the mother's line or the father's line, but not both. Now, because of that, there's two types of unilineal descent, matrilineal descent and patrilineal descent. Matrilineal descent is the mother's line, patrilineal descent is the father's line. Now, our other descent type, multilineal descent, is descent that is traced through both females and males. Now, multilineal descent also has two types. There's ambilineal descent and bilateral descent. Ambilineal descent is descent in which the parents choose a side to affiliate their children with. Bilateral descent is both sides of the family are equal. Now, unilineal descent. For societies that rely on kinship to perform most of their social functions, such as marriage, uh, dispute settlement, religious ceremonies, stuff like that, unilineal descent groups provide a social organization with unambiguous roles and statuses. Now, in these types of societies, a person becomes a member of a unilineal descent group by birth, so it is clear to which group it belongs. Patrilineal descent is by far the more common of the two types of unilineal descent. In a patrilineal descent group, a person is related through the father, the father's father, and so on. So, a man, his own children, his brother's children, are all members of the same descent group. However, his sister's children and his daughter's children are not part of his descent group. Rather, they belong to the descent group of those children's fathers. Now, females must marry outside their own patrilineage, and the children a woman bears belong to the father's lineage to, rather than their own. Now, in a matrilineal descent, a person belongs to the mother's descent group. This is a woman, her siblings, her own children, her sister's children, and her daughter's children. Matrilineal descent groups make up about 15% of the unilineal descent groups found in contemporary societies. And it is important not to confuse this with matriarchy, which is when women in a society have more authority than men. In fact, most cases of matrilineal descent the men still retain the majority of power and authority. For instance, in a patrilineal society, the man passes his property to his son. In a matrilineal society, a man passes his property to his sister's son. All right. Now, multilineal descent groups. Now, multilineal descent groups. These follow the descent thought through males and females. The two patterns are ambilineal and bilateral. 
So, in some societies, an individual belongs to both the mother and the father's lineages. In these cases, some aspects of the descent are matrilineal and others are patrilineal. For example, you know, movable property such as livestock or produce may be inherited from the mother's side, and non-movable property such as land is inherited from the father's side. Now, the first pattern we are going to look at is ambilineal descent. In these societies, parents typically have a choice as to which lineage they wish to affiliate their children to. Whereas with unilineal systems, the parents do not have a choice. Ambilineal systems are more flexible because they allow the parents to choose a lineage. In some cases, the parents must choose. In other cases, the individual is allowed to choose. And in other cases, the individual is allowed to move continuously through life from one group to the next. Okay, moving on to bilateral descent. In these societies, a person is related equally to both the mother and father's side of the family, like here in the US. In a bilateral descent society, we see the treatment of family members, be it grandma, uncle, cousin, <clears throat> are treated equal no matter which side of the family tree they belong. And because of this, we have a kinship group in a bilateral system known as a kindred. Now, a kindred is a group of closely related relatives connected through both parents to one living relative. So there are no two individuals in a bilateral system that have the same kindred, except for siblings. <clears throat> in addition to this, kindreds cannot perform the same functions as unilineal groups, such as joint ownership of property, common economic activities, the regulation of marriage, or even mutual assistance. However, this structure works really well in a society that values individuality, personal independence, and geographic mobility, like our own society. But, what about small-scale societies like the Juhansi? In small-scale societies that are nomadic or semi-nomadic, and in areas where we see resources are scarce, the bilateral system allows people to make claims on a large set of kinsmen, who may be spread over a wide area. Now, this allows them to draw on their kindred during times of need. So. Now that we have looked at descent patterns, we are going to move on to cover residence patterns. So, when two people get married, our culture dictates where they reside. For us here in the US, after marriage, the two people are expected to get their own home separate from either person's family. This is not the case for every culture. In fact, most societies say that they will live with relatives of the wife or husband. Now, there are five types of residence patterns that we are going to look at. The first is patrilocal residence. So, patrilocal residence is when the married couple lives with or near the relatives of the husband's father. Next is matrilocal residence. Matrilocal residence is when the married couple lives with or near the relatives of the wife. The next pattern is avunculocal. A-V-U-N-C-U-L-O-C-A-L. Avunculocal residence. And this is when the married couple lives with 
or near the husband's mother's brother. The next pattern is ambilocal or bilocal residence. And this is when the married couple has a choice of living with either relatives of the wife or with relatives of the husband. And the last residence pattern is neolocal residence. Now, neolocal residence is when the married couple establishes an independent place of residence away from relatives of either spouse. Now, there are seven principles for classifying kin. They are generation, relative age, lineality versus collaterality, gender, consanguineal versus a phenol kin, side of family, and sex of linking relative. So first is generation. Now the generation principle distinguishes ascending and descending generations from ego. Now for us in American society, our parents and their brothers and sisters are one generation. Ourselves and our siblings are another generation. Our children and our siblings' kids another generation, and so on. Now, it is important to realize that generation is different from age. Now, the next one, relative age. A kinship system that uses the relative age principle has different kinship terms for relatives that are older and relatives that are younger than oneself. Next is lineality versus collaterality. Ken related in a single line such as grandfather, father, and then son are called lineal kin. Collateral kin are descended from a common ancestor with ego, but are not ego's direct ascendants or descendants. For example, brothers and sisters and cousins are collateral kin. They are descended from the same ancestor, but are not in a direct ascendant or descendant line. Gender is the next principle, and kinship systems that use the principle of gender have different kin terms for people of different genders. In English, some kinship terms differentiate by gender, such as aunt or uncle, or brother or sister. But cousin, however, does not differentiate by gender. In some other cultures, all kinship terms are distinguished by gender. Uh, now we have consanguineal versus a phenol kin. Uh, this we touched on earlier, and this is the principle that they are divided up by blood relatives and relatives by marriage, such as, you know, son and son in law. Uh, so moving on to side of the family. Some societies use a kinship system in which kin terms distinguish between relatives from the mother's side and families from the father's side. This principle is called bifurcation. An example of this would be where the mother's brother is referred to differently than from the father's brother, like with our Yanomamo example at the beginning. And the last principle is sex of linking relative. Now, in societies in which distinguished collateral relatives is important principle of kinship classification, the sex of the linking relative may be important in the kinship terminology. 
So a linking relative is an individual related to you consanguinely that connects you to another relative. For example, if your mother's sister has children, you are linked to those children through your mother's sister. Now this is when we add in parallel and cross cousins. So when the sex of your parent and the linking relative are the same, the children to whom you are linked with are known as your parallel cousins. So in our previous example, the mother's sister being the linking relative, since our mother is female and her sister is female, they have the same sex. So our mother's sister's children, our cousins, would be our parallel cousins. When the sex is different, they are our cross cousins. So replace mother's sister with mother's brother. Now, in many societies, the U.S. not being one of them, parallel and cross cousins have different kinship terms. Often, the cross cousin term is more distant than the term used for parallel cousins. Now, the seven principles that we just went through are combined to form six different kinship systems. Now, these systems were first described by Lewis Henry Morgan in the 19th century and were given the names of Native American groups, with the exception of the last one. Now, the, sev the uh, six different kinship systems are the Hawaiian, the Eskimo system, the Iroquois, the Omaha, the Crow, the last one, the Sudanese. Now, the Sudanese does not follow the uh, nomenclature of Native American groups, and that is because Lewis Henry Morgan could not find a Native American group that exhibited this pattern. Instead, he found it in Africa and the Sudan. Now, the systems of kinship terminology reflect the kinds of kin groups that are most important in a society. So the first one we are going to look at is the Hawaiian system. Now, the Hawaiian system is found in Polynesia. It is rather simple in that it uses the fewest kinship terms. The Hawaiian system emphasizes the distinction between generations and reflects the equality between the mother's and father's side of the family in relation to ego. All relatives of the same generation and sex are referred to by the same kinship term. Male and female kin in ego's generation are distinguished in terminology but their terms for sister and brother are the same as those for the children of one parent's siblings. This system correlates with ambilineality and ambilocality, which means that depending on circumstances and choice, a person may belong to either the mother's or father's descent group. Now, using the same terms for parents and their siblings establishes closeness with a larger number of relatives in an ascending generation, giving ego a wide choice in deciding which group to affiliate and live with. Next is the Eskimo system. The Eskimo terminology found among hunting and gathering peoples in North America is correlated with bilateral descent. The Eskimo system 
emphasizes the nuclear family by using terms for its members that are not used for any other kin. Outside the nuclear family, many kinds of relatives that are distinguished in other systems are lumped together. Now, all of the children of the par parental generation are referred to as cousin, and there is no distinction between males and females. The key factor with this system is that it treats the biologically closest group of relations so that the nuclear family is special, but everyone also is more or less equal. Next up is the Iroquois system, and the Iroquois system is associated with matrilineal descent and emphasizes the importance of unilineal descent groups. In this system, the same term is used for mother and mother's sister, or father and father's brother. Parallel cousins are referred to by the same terms as though for brother and sister. The father's sister and mother's brother are distinguished from other kin, as are the children of the father's sister and mother's brother, which are Ego's cross cousins. The next kinship system is the Omaha system. The Omaha system is found among patrilineal peoples, including the Native American group it is named after. In this system, the same term is used for the father and the father's brother, and for mother and mother's sister. Parallel cousins are equated with siblings, but cross cousins are referred to by separate terms. In addition to this, a man refers to his own children by the same terms he applies to his brother's children, but different to that in which he applies to his sister's children. Now, these terms are extended to all relations who are classified as Ego's brothers and sisters. So in this system, there is a merging of generations on the mother's side. All men who are members of Ego's mother's patrilineage will be called mother's brother, regardless of their age or generational relationship to Ego. This generational merging is not applied to the relations on the father's side. The different terminology applied to the father's and mother's patrilineal groups reflects the different position of ego in relation to this kin. Generational differences are important on the father's side because members of the ascending generation are likely to have some authority over ego and be treated differently from patrilineage members of ego's own generation. The mother's patrilineage is unimportant. It is reflected by lumping them all together in the terminology. Remember from uh, one of our early experiments that the more words that you have for something, the more important it is for the culture. And this can be seen in our kinship terminology. Next is the Crow system, and the Crow system is the matrilineal equivalent of the Omaha system. So the Omaha is patrilineal, the Crow is matrilineal. This means that the relations on the male side are lumped together, whereas generational differences are recognized 
in the mother's matrilineal group. Now, in both Omaha and Crow systems, the overriding importance of unilineality leads to the subordination of other principles of classifying kin, such as relative age or generation. Now, the final system that we're going to look at is the Sudanese. Now, like I said earlier, this goes against the Native American naming rule, as it was not practiced by any Native Americans. So instead, uh, Lewis Henry Morgan named it after the African groups found primarily in Ethiopia who do use it. Um, this is also used in Turkey and in ancient Rome. Now, the Sudanese is the most descriptive terminology system. The types included here use different terms for practically every relative. You know, siblings, paternal parallel cousins, maternal parallel cousins, paternal cross cousins, maternal cross cousins. They all have different terminology. Now, ego refers to their parents by... Uh, distinct terms for those for father's brother, father's sister, mother's sister, and mother's brother. The group using Sudanese kinship tend to be strongly patrilineal and very concerned with issues of wealth, class, and power. Okay, this has been lecture series three, part one covering the basics of kinship structures from an anthropological perspective. In part two, we will be looking at marriage and family systems.